Hey guys, today's talk is with Chris Doe. He's an Emmy Award winning designer, founder of The Future, one of the largest online communities for creatives. So if you design logos, if you sell digital services, if you design websites, you definitely want to check this out and you probably want to join his online community. We're going to be talking about how to survive selling creative services in COVID-19 times. It's not easy out there. So we're going to be figuring out how to get the pipeline full, how to keep it full, how to attract customers with badass content. And it's a very insightful, inspirational talk. So I hope you like it. We do Q&A at the end. As always, love comments and feedback. Please subscribe. Please share with your friends. Let's start with a, a bio. Tell us a little bit about your history and how you got to where you're at. Sure. I graduated from Art Center College of Design with a degree in graphic design in 1995 uh, after having worked briefly at an advertising agency in Seattle and then punk rock music label Epitaph Records. I decided to go off on my own and create my own company, which which is called Blind. So that was incorporated in December of 1995. We've been going strong since then, making mostly commercials and music videos for some of the biggest bands and brands in the world. That's Love a snapshot that. bio. And then in the last couple of years, I would say the last six years, I ventured off into creating content. Uh, first, mostly kind of reluctantly as a host on a YouTube channel with my friend and partner at that time, Jose Caballero. And since then have reincorporated as the future. And now this is all that we do. We don't do any more client work. We've left client work behind since December of 2018. You gotta share it. Share us. Share it with us. How do you do that? How do you say no to clients? That's what I want to get from this webinar. It's difficult. I mean, we're we're kind of hardwired to work with clients. We like to please other people, make them happy, to help their business improve and grow and all that kind of stuff. So it's very hard to walk away from, especially if you take into consideration some of the projects and clients we've worked with. We've worked with everybody from from Nike to Sony, Microsoft, PlayStation. We've worked with some really big car brands like Audi. We've worked with bands like Coldplay. Uh, some smaller bands like the Ravenettes and uh, Jet. Had a lot of fun doing this work. It's super sexy work, 30 second commercials, uh, a couple of main titles for feature films. But then it comes to this point in which you, you look back on two decades worth of work and you've win, you win awards and you wonder to yourself, what else? What else am I gonna do with my life? And it's just the rat race all over again, even two decades into it. People make you pitch. They're constantly asking you for your ideas, not always paying for them. So it's a difficult thing. How, one, big, how big was the agency when you grew it at its height? At its height, at the highest was in 2017. I think that year we did almost $7 million. No, or seven, like around $7 million, I think. And we were at one point a bi-coastal agency with a much smaller satellite office in New York. And then since then have um, just went back to just being an uh, LA-based design and motion, motion design firm. And we were just grinding weight. We've been as many as 20 plus people. And right now we're 12 people full time with uh, three people who work off site. So a total of 15 people. Hmm. So you, I mean, you obviously have a, a ton of freelancers, agency owners, creatives inside your community, which is, I mean, it's humongous. You've got 600,000 subscribers on your, your personal YouTube. I, I think you've got about a hundred thousand in the future community as well, like on email lists. Yes. What's the feeling of the, what, what's going on right now? I think we went from the oh, yeah. scale, scale, scale to survive in a matter of weeks. Yes. It, and all plans kind of went out the window as soon as the global pandemic hit the U.S., right? And, and it was kind of like in a moment, like slow motion car accident where you think in disbelief, this is not going to come here. It's not going to hit it like the way it is in Asia. And sure enough, it did. And in hindsight, we should have reacted even faster than what we did. But right now, everybody's in this place where the economic market, that flow of money that used to happen, it's totally frozen. That, that stream that used to move, it just stuck with the exception of a few businesses. I've had friends who are like, no, everything's going to be fine. They call me up uh, days later and saying, all my clients have postponed or canceled their projects. What am I going to do? And I hear just from like an exceptional few companies, just on a handful of them getting busier than they were pre-COVID, but everybody else is kind of in the same yeah. funk. We don't know what to, we, what to do. Work has slowed down or, or completely dried up. And even if there was work, 
we don't see anything beyond that. No new projects are coming and nobody's talking to us. Cause you know, the pipeline has to kind of be full all the time all the because time. those prospects and leads don't always turn out to be clients. Did you start, when did you start blind? In 1995, December, 1995. So it, you know, you started significantly before, well, there was a different or oil crisis or a different crisis back yeah. then. Um, yeah. I started my agency because I felt like it was recession proof. <laughs> You know, and I think this is this has been an experience where everyone is learning that nothing nothing is safe, um, you know, especially services. Yes. What are you? What kind of conversations are you having with kind of people in your Facebook groups and you know online when you know they say the pipeline's drying up? Yeah, I think first uh, I I think it's like the stages of grieving versus shock or denial like it's not happening and then there's anger like who's to blame for this kind of stuff i think we're working through all that stuff at some point you're going to have to come to this decision in your life right now and i i think what happens with any kind of crisis like the one that we're facing right now is that it just reveals what was underneath all this stuff it's easy for people to talk about how how happy they are how well they're doing the progress they're making in their life and something like this strips away all those exterior veneers or facade and it reveals the true you if you're a person who's prone to panic, if you're a person who's prone to being afraid or one who's courageous and dives or runs towards the fire, it's going to reveal that. And so right now, everybody is just trying to process. And the decision that they have to make is this, is there are things that you can worry about, things that are completely out of your control. And then there's action that you can take, things that you can do. So, so let's you, talk about that. Are, yeah. are, you, are you changing your content to be more specific to the times now? For a little bit, we were because I was thinking like, I don't want to be tone deaf to what's going on. Yeah. So I put on Twitter, hey, I understand everybody's in a state of panic right now. What kind of content can we make to help you in this period? So initially they're like, tell us about COVID-19. Uh, get some mental health professionals in here so that we can process what's going on. And that's what we literally did in the first couple of days. We invited a, a specialist of infectious disease, uh, Dr. Yang, to come in to talk to us. I needed to hear that information too because there's so much disinformation that's going out there, misinformation, that you kind of have to get the record straight. Mm -hmm. And then you kind of have to process the emotions that you're going through right now. And once you're through that, once you realize what's happening, now it's time, like, let's get back to work, man. And so it's an adjustment period. For speaking for myself and the team, we're almost all working remotely and it's been pretty interesting, some challenges in communication uh, and there was an initial dip in productivity. And then once we kind of find our rhythm, now I have more content than I've ever had in the pipeline to release. It's almost like too much content. And how has that been with you not being able to shoot with your, you know, your, your production team and being in a studio? That's been a challenge for sure. Cause I really do like working with the team um, I do a lot of live streams, but really I enjoy working with other human beings to see a face across from me, to have a conversation with somebody to see like they're, they're, they, they recoil because of something I said was shocking to them or them getting angry or happy or elated. I need that kind of energy. So speaking to a screen, a piece of glass, that's not fun for me, but yeah. you got to survive. You got to keep moving on. And so luckily for, for most of us, like the main people who make content on our channel already have amazing home setups. Like you're looking at, this is my home setup. Okay. My, my kids are downstairs. This is upstairs in the den and I have lights and cameras and everything already ready to go. So now I just have to record content and send it to the editors while they work on it offsite somewhere. So let's talk about content. You know, we were talking last time um, about speed to market the importance of it. I told you a story, story, I think two weeks ago now where I was featured in this pub, you know, a month and a half ago, two months talking about what, you know, what potentially COVID-19 will teach us about working remote. And this was before shelter in place orders. Okay. That publication took three weeks to get live. As soon as I, it goes live, I call them. I go, you have to get that removed immediately. If the content's not relevant anymore, it's completely right. sensitive. It's like, duh. It's new world. New world. Yeah. What does that mean for agency owners who are working on their lead magnets, their, their assets, things about working from home? How do they get the information out? Wow. Okay. So I, I was thinking about this, preparing for our call today to kind of try to help people and understand like what's going on. Uh, there's an expression. It's like, it's kind of pointless to get blood from a stone. Mm. If your clients, if the people that you serve, the people that you depend on getting work from, are they themselves going out of business, furloughing their employees, 
the last thing on their mind right now is to spend more money. And I think they also have to go through that initial denial and anger period for them to kind of say, okay, take a deep breath. What can we do now? How can we marshal up our forces and figure out where opportunity is? I recently put out this graphic, this illustration that shows that through crisis, it reveals what you were weak at. But underneath all that, if you keep digging, get rid of the hammer and the chisel, get a shovel and start digging, underneath of that is opportunity. And I think there's opportunity everywhere. As I listen to um, not so much the news, but like NPR, and I'm kind of listening on, as to how the industries that are being impacted by, by this kind of shutdown, like how, how Netflix is all of a sudden now worth more. I've read this, I'm not sure if it's true, worth more than Disney. Hmm. And they're like, okay, there's opportunity there. And I was thinking also now more than ever, I'm more reliant on my internet connection going at a certain speed. And so for people who can help others and get their home network set up with cameras and video conferencing, with fast Wi-Fi, some kind of mesh network. So if you're in that space, you can do really well. So there are businesses that are going to sort this stuff out and they're going to be ahead of the curve in terms of growing where the economy is totally stagnant. And if you can start to, start to think about like what businesses are growing right now, change who you focus on, change your target market. Figure out if I build websites, if I do branding and identity systems, I probably want to work with one of these companies that are probably getting more phone calls than anybody else for new work. Hmm. No, it's true. I think this is the best time to be investing in your infrastructure. You know, we're both agency owners. The, the, the hardest thing about an agency is maintaining our brand website because as soon as we put it out, it's already outdated. It doesn't have yeah. the new content and case studies. What are your thoughts on fixing the plumbing, you know, as it relates to tool services. Yesterday, my buddy called me, Hey, I want to upgrade to Quiller. What do you think about that for Dex? Mm -hmm. uh, so what are, what are things that internally that some of the creatives out there can be doing? Yeah, this is a kind of a broad answer. So you guys take it with a pinch of salt here. It depends on your personal circumstances, your situation, what's going on. But you often hear people say this, something like this. I'm so busy. That's why my site is outdated. I don't have time to refresh this because I'm busy putting out fires. And that's been a pretty good reason for a really long time. Now you have no more reason. So if you have the resources, if you have people who are on payroll, who you could use instead of letting them go, work on those things now because when things pick up and they will eventually, you'll be that much further ahead and you won't ever find a better time than something like this right now because everybody's in the same situation. How do you, how did you write some of your case studies with Nike and some of the big brands? I know that's a challenge for a lot of creatives out there. Yeah, I have to admit that uh, if you, it depends on when you look back on the case studies that we wrote, some of them are not very good because we follow a pretty predictable formula. One that we inherited from the publicity agents, PR reps that we had at that time, which was like, try to make it like sound super sexy and talk about cool new innovative techniques or things you've done. And that's what we did for a long time. And then we realized, I think we're just writing for more creatives and not really for clients. Exactly. So I think the shift happened a couple of years back when we started to talk about like, you know what, the design is a byproduct of our thinking and the decisions that we made to help the client's business grow. We should start there. That at the end of the day, if we can't improve something in their business, then it doesn't really matter how sexy or how good looking that the video is or how cool the animation is. It doesn't really matter. So we have to write and think differently. No, I completely agree. And as creatives, especially designers, we forget that the people who are going to be looking at those case studies are likely finance people mm. who approve the budgets. It's the CFOs, mm. it's COOs, it's stakeholders that they want to see as much tangible as example, the ROIs, how many users, what was the impact? Um, so, you know, I know you talk about this a lot in your content, the storytelling aspects, how do you translate that to, you know, your brand, your case study and investing in the storytelling now? Yeah, so I'll give you a little tip on storytelling structure because I used to teach this for a number of years at Art Center, which awesome. is you have to think about the way things are, the normal, right? And then something happens to challenge that normal and then you're able to explode or, or what uh, Kendra Hall calls the car crash. And then there's the new normal. 
So if you think about your client's business, like you can say, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Johnson had XYZ business and they were going really well for the last 25 years. And then something bad happened to them and the market changed and they started to lose business. It's which in this point in time. So now we're all like leaning in like, yeah, yeah. What happened? That we revitalized their business by changing the infrastructure, improving their, their uh, speed to market delivery or whatever. Uh, we've, we've improved their platform. The customer service ratings have doubled. In, in terms of positive reviews, this is how we did it. And this is what it looks like. So you kind of have to plant uh, the seed of like what the problem is and be very clear because the solution doesn't really matter so much if you don't understand the context of the problem. I, I know I love that. I use, and also voice memos. A lot of people here might tr struggle with copywriting, you know, mm -hmm. just writing down notes, um, at Rootstrap, we've done a lot of internal podcasting because a lot of the context of each project, especially from people who worked on that is so important, especially in agency, there's high turnover. So it's hard to find the original designer when you're writing the case study, you know, a year ago, let's say. Yes. Um, so those are some things that I've learned, but I love that. So I'm sure a lot of people out there are, are just listening and watching and going, how do I pivot from agency to content? <laughs> How do I do that? <laughs> well, you have to ask yourself, do you want to do this because you feel a deep burning desire, a passion to do this from the inside? Or are you doing it as, you know, I'm drowning in a swimming pool. I will grab any available limb and I'll pull themselves down with me. Because here's the thing. Uh, I, I just did a, a live stream with James Victoria. He asked this very simple question. How bad do you want it? Mm. This is going to separate the posers from and the pretenders from the pros. And you don't want to be one of those people because things will get tough. It will appear for a period of time that you're doing a lot of work for not a lot of results. But if this is truly what you want, if this, there's a burning desire inside of you, you will manifest it into reality. And I really do believe in this. So for me, for many, many years, I've taught for over 15 years I taught. I just wanted to find a different way to express my teaching to, uh, to more people, to make it scalable. And so we had a lot of failures and a lot of missteps and, and some, some learning lessons that we had to kind of get through before we found our rhythm. So for a lot of people, and, and I get this all the time, as sure you do as well, somebody reach out to me on direct message on uh, Instagram and say, hey, yeah, so uh, it's not really growing. My account is not growing as fast as I, I would hope. And then I looked at it, at their account. It's like they've done 40 posts. <laughs> you know, talk to me when you get to 1,000. I mean, you're expecting results at 40 posts into this. It doesn't even make sense to me. You're, you're barely learning the vocabulary and you want to write uh, uh, some, uh, like a Shakespeare. You want to be Shakespeare all of a sudden? Like compose a few sentences, like put some things together and then start to get a feel for it and to keep staying curious and, and asking yourself, like, what did I do well in this post and what could I do better in the future? So if you want to get into creating content and diversifying your business, well, kudos to you. So first thing is, Let's, let's separate the people who are doing it because everybody else is doing it. The Joneses are doing it. Let's keep up with the Joneses. Now, if you really want to do this, there's a very simple thing. Ask yourself this question. What do I have to share with somebody that they would find to be valuable? And are there enough of those people that a market or a product can, can be sustained? Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't have anything that I can do that's valuable. So here's what you need to do. You need to get into the practice of being able to tell other people what it is that you know and paying attention to what parts they lean into so for example ben you and i are doing this live stream we're broadcasting to your network and they're going to be commenting and then we can start to see patterns of engagement where they really like certain parts and they really don't like other parts we'll take note of that so other people generally are better judges of what we think is uh, of what is valuable than what we think this is kind of important because you think this is so natural. I know these things. I've done these things for a really long time. You kind of become numb to your own genius in a way. So being in a situation where you're able to teach and talk to other people, you can start to see like when their eyes light up, that's the good stuff. And you want to start to build something off that. If you don't have the benefit of being around people this way, there's other ways to test this. Try writing a post, try putting out a couple of tweets and seeing what people engage with drop a couple of carousels, make a few videos and really pay attention to the metrics and to the engagement and how people are responding to your work. From there, you get a pretty good clue as to what it is that people want from you.
I'm glad you brought up the carousels. I, I, I got to know you talk about it a lot. Your, uh, your, your team members and, and everyone who are in the, the future VIP groups, I see yep. tons of the carousel content. So what is that? Why should we be doing it? Okay. Um, just to step back a little bit. Now you do realize this, that the number one thing all these social platforms want from you is for you, the, the end user, to spend more time. So they devise all kinds of vehicles to drive you to engage with them even more. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get good ROI, good return on investment in terms of your time and your energy, then you need to start to learn how the algorithm looks at your work and how likely it is to share with other people so that your network can grow. That's the fundamental part, okay? Once you start to understand that. So what do platforms want? They want people to spend more time. And so they develop new tools and features in order to capture more of your time. It makes a lot of sense. There's a war for your attention that's going on right now, and it's happening on YouTube, on Twitter, on Facebook, LinkedIn, TikTok, and Instagram. They all want more of what you have. So they roll out new features. So if you use the new features and you're early in on this, there will be less competition for you before it becomes totally mainstream. So what these platforms do is when, when Instagram released this carousel, which is what I guess the common term is, where you're having a multi-slide post, up to 10 images at a time. Well, they want you to adopt that feature so they reward you for doing that. They're finding that instead of people scrolling vertically, they're gonna scroll horizontally, it changes the action, and it keeps them on their platform longer. So somebody had mentioned to me, there's this new thing, you, you should do this. And then when I saw the application of this as a teaching tool, that's really when the dots connected for me because I have literally hundreds of decks, keynotes that I've given uh, as part of workshops and classes and talks that I've done that are hundreds of slides deep. Man, I have content for days then. So then it was just learning about how to craft a keynote presentation in 10 slides that tells a story without you speaking. That was the learning curve. And once I figured that out, I was able to grow my account super fast. It's hard to believe this, but I was growing at over 10,000 new followers, organic, non-paid, non-spammy, 10,000 followers per week. So I went from about 80,000 followers on Instagram, and now I'm going to hit 300,000 pretty soon. Wow. Using carousels. Yeah. It, I, I, I think there's also a misconception that you have to be this um, kind of complete original reinvent the wheel content creator. And it's just not true. You had a lot of decks that you're able to repurpose. To me, a successful content creator is, is knows the efficiency. And mm. I, for example, retwist posts from LinkedIn and I'll yep. post on Instagram. Instagram gets retwisted. I take TikTok ideas. I retwist it for my LinkedIn and you know, the whole thing. Um, what do you tell people when they say they're, they feel like they're too embarrassed to do that? You know, and they think oh, they like have repurposing their content. I mean, if you think about it, you're, you're you're developing a library of content and assets that you can repurpose and you can remix, and you want to be able to do that actually because you don't want to post the same content on all social platforms. So for me, uh, and I put a video out on this. I start with the tweet. I test all my ideas. Uh, I shouldn't say that. I test most of my ideas on Twitter first because the reaction is immediate. People are very active on Twitter. And I can put something out and, and kind of test the temperature of the water, so to speak. And if I get a lot of engagement on it, it's a clue to me that this may or may not work. So before I invest a lot of time, I wanted to try ideas out on Twitter. Here's the really cool part. There are a lot of crazy animals on Twitter and there are a lot of smart people on Twitter too. Yeah. So when I put out a tweet, oftentimes people will say, oh, you quoted the wrong person or this reminds me of a Buddhist philosophy or something else, much deeper than what I would have known. So I use my friends and followers on Twitter as creative writing partners and get this part that don't get paid. They just help me write the thing. So they help to sharpen it like iron sharpens iron. And so they help to build something. I'm like, I think the thing that I wanna say is a combination of all these things. So oftentimes I will repurpose the same tweet and write it again in the next cycle and see if this works better. Wow. And I think Twitter's okay with that because I haven't been flamed for this at all. Oh, that's, that's your, right. uh, that's your validation. Yeah. It's like you're, you're testing and iterating and you're validating the product or the idea if it has legs. And then I take that and I go on to Instagram and I create a 10 slide carousel. Now it could just be that I'm busy or I'm lazy. It could be both that I don't even spend that much time making my Instagram carousels anymore. 
I found out that there isn't necessarily a correlation between time spent on making something versus the amount of engagement and follows. So I have a very simple template I've set up in Keynote and I drop the text in. I make sure it paces well. Colors are nice and there's good contrast. And if I feel so inclined, I'll add images or graphics, but it's not necessary. At the end of the day, it's the idea. And then if that works, I'll take that and I'll turn it into a whiteboard session where I use those exact same slides and convert them into a whiteboard session that I record live on our video stream. And it's been very successful for us because it's been all tested already. It's making a hit on top of a hit. Wow, love that. So it, it starts with Twitter validation, yes. moves to a visual carousel, and then is it YouTube Live? Yeah, I, I, I print out large sheets that I draw on top of, and then that becomes a live stream. And the live stream is generally 45 minutes to an hour and a half. Those get cut down to micro episodes. They take the best parts. Like if there's a five-step process, you could bet there's gonna be five videos that come out of that. And let me explain that for a little bit, okay? Because you know that the, the average uh, attention span or the amounts of minutes viewed on a YouTube video is actually quite short. For a lot of people, it's under five minutes. We have really long live streams, so ours is a little higher than average, maybe nine to 12 minutes, okay? So we know that if we have this one piece of content, uh, Gary Vee calls it pillar content, this hour and a half long video, master content, whatever you want to call it. What we want to do is create little videos that are kind of spawning off of this. So if you can visualize this, visualize a wheel like an old wagon wheel. The hub is that core evergreen content that's an hour and a half long. The spokes that come out of the hub are the cut downs, the remixes, whatever. And basically those support the hub and it creates this effect where each one connects to the next one. And it really drives up the traffic. If you can create your content and think like this, you'll do well for yourself. Interesting. And then, so you, it, those are the main priorities. You, how do you keep up with the other ones? You've got podcasting. I would imagine some original stuff on Facebook, some are also recycled from that process. Um, like, how do you know what to prioritize? Yeah, so that, that is a tricky thing. For us right now, our priorities are in making evergreen YouTube content. And hopefully some of those products our videos tied to our products so that we can actually make money because we're not really making any real money on YouTube, right? Your AdSense revenue is quite low. So for us, it's, it's making the YouTube uh, audience grow so that they become more aware of what we do. Yep. This is the top of the funnel awareness so that people are like, huh, um, I thought that guy was annoying. I'll give the second video a try. And he's growing on me a little bit, still kind of too cocky for my taste, but third or fourth video in, they're like, I think I like this guy. I think I like his sense of humor and his brand. And, oh, there's a website here. Let's go check it out. And then they start to go into your funnel. We've already built up the rapport and hopefully with some people we've built up trust. Yeah, I, I, uh, I've always been thinking, I've been thinking about that a lot lately of how YouTube subscribers to me seem like the most loyal ones because they will literally opt into your email list um, they'll, they'll follow you on other platforms. Whereas a lot of platform followers, like on Instagram, they're not going to take the time to move over on, you know, your YouTube. And then now with TikTok, it's, it's not as inclusive where you can actually, you know, pull out your, your followers and they can jump to Instagram and YouTube, but I haven't been seeing that conversion as much. Yeah, I think it's tricky. And I think it really is largely dependent on the kind of content that you put out there. If you put out light content uh, that doesn't really go deep on anything, when you ask somebody to bounce, they're not gonna bounce with you. So what we aim to do, which is one of my guiding uh, points here is to, to make sure I make content that I feel like I've helped improve somebody's life. I really think like that because they've given me something very precious, their time and attention, and I don't want to waste that. I don't wanna disrespect that and dishonor it. So I spent a lot of time trying to craft something that I think, you know what, if you actually follow this advice, if you did this shortcut or this technique, it'll shave minutes and then over the years, hours off of your life. Mm -hmm. And if you find that to be valuable, maybe you'll follow me. Maybe you'll do what I want you to do when I ask you to. And I have to be careful that I don't ask too often and I ask in a very genuine and open and transparent way. Hmm. Love it, fascinating. All right, so we've talked a lot about content. Uh, decommoditizing yourself or your services as an agency, I think is going to be now important than ever. Yes. Um, we're, we're going to be facing a major race to the bottom where 
just because you're going to have to be slashing your prices for maybe years to come. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? And what do you recommend for agency owners out there who need to either productize a service offering or somehow decommoditize themselves from the company you're offering? Yeah, if you can diversify where you get your money from, you're going to be a little bit more insulated from swings in the market like the ones we're seeing today. Now, luckily for us, we left service work behind over a year ago. But if we were still in the service business, it would give us a heck of a cushion to fall back on like when clients stall out or projects uh, freeze up and weird things happen, right? So if you can diversify how you make money, I think that's helpful. So you can do the old garage cleaning, garage sale concept that was you know, from the book Rework, the, the founders of Basecamp, 37 Signals. He talked about this. He's like, go into your digital garage, which is everything that you've created. Because when you create something, you create byproducts, right? So when I build an animation, I create uh, matte paintings, I create texture files, brushes, animation presets, and rigs. And I've never thought to repurpose those things. Well, if you start to comb through the stuff, the junk you've accumulated, when you make something, you make lots of other things. Think about what you can break out and sell. Now, here's the story. Um, Henry, I think it's Henry Ford. Uh, in the production of his cars, there was a lot of waste wood. And they used to pay people to throw that stuff away. And then he had this bright idea. It's like, we could take all the sawdust and we can compress them into these charcoal briquettes. And, and he teamed up with somebody. And that's why there's kings for charcoal charcoal hmm. it's like taking your junk repackaging it and creating a whole new market and a whole new industry now if that's all they were doing was making charcoal they would do pretty well but they actually make lots of other things obviously their core business being making cars so look at your stuff look at the texture files the brushes the presets everything that you have bundle it together and sell that stuff diversify a little bit and if you can then also look at who you serve and diversify there and think about where else the grass is green, the kind of blue ocean, using the same techniques and tools that you have, who else can you serve that's just untapped? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, we, um, we, we've been very uh, grateful with different swings, managing those different cycles of our business with road mapping, discovery, um, you know, productizing small engagements, I've done a lot of free coaching this month from uh, just, I, I put up Clarity FM and basically put my profile for free. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had a one call with, with an agency owner yesterday. And he, um, we talked about that, I, getting micro commitments right now. Yeah. Uh, $500 to scope a project, build a landing page, get something to start building trust. Because once this global pause does end, they will need providers. And Companies are doing a lot of layoffs. They'll still have technology. They'll still have creative that needs to get done. Yeah. Yeah. So if, say takes for example, for a second here, Ben, you and I are doing media. We're doing content stuff. And then all of a sudden the world is waking up to this, like Zoom. Like we have to do distance based communication. We have to work remote. We have to work from home. Man, we've been in this game for years. So if there are people out there, like not that I want to do service work, but if there are people out there, educators especially, if you need help in figuring out how to do this, I mean, it's kind of embarrassing that uh, I saw this post on Twitter that they had a screenshot of like the, the big four late night talk show hosts. And like, hey, have you guys ever heard of using a DSLR and a capture device? Because they're running on some like web camera. It's like, how can we be more ahead of the game than, than these people are worth a hundred times more than what we're worth? Guys, get with the program here. I know. And that's another area opportunity. Um, I had someone that another kid that I coach, I told him start doing uh, screencasts on fiber, teach people how to use zoom, do remote login sessions, help them get their software established. Most of our, the bigger enterprise clients are the ones struggling. And we work with a major retailer um, and their, you know, their offices are in Dubai and Saudi Arabia and yeah. they can't even install a lot of these products like zoom. So they're not even, they've been handicapped for weeks. Right. Right. Um, so it's, believe it or not, for everyone tuning in out there, it's it's the bigger fish right now that are are having a lot more challenges than small mid market who are able to adapt or they have good help internally from some of the the professional social distancers. <laughs> the ones have been doing it a while before it was a thing. Um, Big organizations 
move really slowly. They, they, it's very hard to turn the ship. And I think a lot of it sometimes is because people are just concerned about not losing their job. And so they're like, that's not my responsibility. I'm not looking into that because that's more work for me that I'm not getting paid for. Smaller agencies, smaller studios are a lot more agile, quicker to adapt to what's going on. So that there, there is most definitely opportunity there. Hmm. Love it. Let's talk about lead gen and then we're going to be moving into Q&A. So uh, I haven't checked the message threads, but uh, if you can submit your Q&A questions in the bubble, I see uh, seven cool. and you keep putting more in everyone. That would be fantastic. Um, so lead gen, a lot of, you know, some of the, I'm, it's a humongous challenge right now. Um, yeah. Working closely with my sales and marketing teams, especially the ones doing outbound. Um, this whole month has been, um, really lead with empathy, mm -hmm. not sell. Uh, it's, we have a health committee established at our agency. We want to support you on some of the transition work, um, legal terms of use for COVID updates. There's so many things that need to get done um, that we've been attacking a lot of the outbound efforts that way versus the greetings to the day, Chris, we can help you with Ruby development, which um, is just, it's insensitive. And I, I, I'm a firm believer in how you act now is how you're going to be remembered after this whole, um, you know, experience. Yeah. So what are some people, what can they be doing now, either in terms of hunting or farming existing business to fill the pipeline? Yeah. I, I think when, when we get messages about people marketing during this time, it feels a little out of place and off character or a little desperate, but then I've also seen campaigns that people do that are very inventive, that fresh and make me laugh a little bit. And I'll share a couple of them with you. Right. One is from a, a, what is that, fast casual restaurant chain that's here uh, in LA called Tender Greens. And Tender Greens sent this thing out because I know for a lot of people going out to the grocery store, dealing with the lines and all that kind of stuff has been pretty nasty. So they already have the supply chain and the distribution model. So they started shifting away from making just solely pre-prepared -pre food that you eat to like here's a box of pasta and wine and bread, things that are kind of just hard to get now because they have the suppliers. And so they started to sell packages like this. And as a little kind of wink in there, like, and if for every order that you put in, we'll throw in a roll of toilet paper. Hmm. So that, that, that's kind of funny. There's another one here from G-Star, which is a clothing company that I love. And G-Star had this virtual work from home kind of runway so they had a bunch of their models. I, I assume they shipped them a bunch of clothes and they're just walking down a very small hallway. You can tell like some of them live in New York and it's a tiny little place and they would cut it to a beat. I was like, hey, that's, that's kind of funny. It made me go and check out their site because it made me laugh. Yeah. Uh, there are people who are selling shirts now. The shirts are on sale, not the pants because nobody is wearing pants right now and you don't need that. So again, I think there's fun and creative ways to do that that don't seem insensitive, that you're actually being really smart and funny. When you go to that, that uh, Me Too marketing campaign, that's really where you run into a lot of trouble where people are going to like, what now? You're going to try to do this? And you're seeing a lot of the big brands facepalm. Uh, like Pretty Mazda. much. The, the creative is so horrible from some of the big brands. That is another opportunity. Even if you don't do communications and creative, but you think you can help some of your existing or new clients, like they all need help with communication right now and how to manage this. The Mazdas are like, I know we can't drive by now, but when we can, and you know, it's just feels so wash your hands. It's just like, no, did you really just do that? Um, yes. So, it, marketing what, cars what, right now is going to be really tricky. You guys, let's just think about that. What are, yeah. I mean, what are, what, I mean, if you were still shooting commercials yeah. and, and working in that world, how would you advise a brand? Wow. Okay. The first thing I would say is like, are, are people watching our commercials right now? And if we're going to spend uh, $4 million on the media buy, is there something else that we can do in the world that's actually going to be productive and good? And then if we can loosely be associated with that, then all the better, right? So for example, there's a real concern about homeless people because there's no shelter in place for them. They have nowhere else to go. Why don't you spend your money and help people like that? You know, you could simply go like for Maza, let's just say, go pick people up in your vans and bring them to the homeless shelter or these facilities that are being built for homeless people. I, I heard that they're like bringing, uh, I guess, for converting former hotel motels into spaces that homeless people can stay in. Yet you have the space, use it to help somebody, be a part of something that's good. And I think you're going to build a lot more goodwill than you would if you were just trying like, now's a great time, zoom, zoom. It doesn't make sense at all. 
I love that. And you know, it, it, the smart modern companies are going to do that. And I saw Google as well doing some really good um, content around thanking our healthcare workers and they didn't, you know, they didn't even really brand it Google that much. So right. you, distancing your brand as well, <laughs> you know, in your advertising is not a bad thing. Not a bad thing. Like it should like be the third read to whatever it is that you're doing. All right. So let's hop into some Q and A. All right. Um, can we see Chris's face? Well, I think you see it now. So you don't see my face. <laughs> No. I've been in Chris. What advice uh, would you give for leveraging content to grow the personal brand and business at this day and age? I will let you go first, my friend. Okay. Lever uh, say the question one more time. Well, well, what advice would you give uh, for leveraging content to grow your personal brand and business at this day and age? Mm. I, I think this is uh, a rule that I would apply even pre COVID-19, which is, a lot of people think marketing is advertising, which is just to kind of repeat the same message. I need something. I want something from you. And we've come to realize advertising doesn't bring customers. It doesn't win you friends. It actually drives customers away because you're interrupting my life with your junk. So I, I think uh, in, in Seth Godin's book, This Is Marketing, he talks about maybe we need a different definition of marketing, that it should be the generous act of helping other people achieve their goals and not yours. So it takes a whole different mindset and you have to play really long if you really want a marketing to be effective. So a lot of people, they'll cleverly and not so cleverly disguise helpful advice, tools and tips and tricks on how to hire them or how to buy their products or use their services. We can see right through that. Like, come on, your, your audience is a lot smarter than you think. Don't talk to them like that. The reason why I think we have traction in what we post and share is because they would have to work really hard to figure out what the hell we're selling because we're not selling anything. All we want to do is create content to help people. And in turn, we build goodwill, awareness, and we gain credibility that we're in, we're in this uh, to help each other, not just to make a buck. And then the, a really weird thing happens. People call you up to give you work. It's kind of ironic and how that's set up. The more you chase something, the more people run away. The more you take a step back, the more they lean in. So if you want somebody to lean in, whisper. Yeah, I love that. I share a lot of those same uh, sentiments. I, to add to that, I open source a lot of my content, uh, about a $700 value pack, which uh, feel free to ping me on any social media if you wanted to get on that list. But to my whole mailing list, I, I open sourced all that. I'm seeing a lot of other creators and instructors do the same. Um, I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting people work for free, but right now is certainly a time to give back, educate, and I promise you it will pay massive dividends because you're still getting the email list and you're still getting that distribution um, when you can monetize and create products and services. So don't go in with... Uh, you know, expectations of, of creating content to make money. I think it's right now um, value. The value exchange needs to be real. It can't be bullshit. 100%. A good rule of thumb or a test is to say, would somebody pay for this thing that you're putting out there? And how much would they pay? And would you yourself pay? And have you paid for this kind of information before? If you can't answer yes, affirmative to all of these things, maybe it's not a good piece of content. Very true. Um, okay. Chris, I think I've heard you speak about this before, but can you talk about imposter syndrome and the fear of putting something out there? Yeah. So imposter syndrome is something that you feel like you're not worthy, that you're not ready and all these kinds of things. But I think that's really, and procrastination is the same thing, is, is an, unfortunately your brain telling you we're not ready to hear what the world is going to say about this. And so we make up a lot of reasons. We tell ourselves a story in our mind that prevents us from doing something. The only cure that I know for this is actually just to go do it. And there's a lot of psychological tricks that you can, you can try, but to, just to cut right through it, whatever it is that you're afraid of, put it out there. What happens is usually never nearly uh, a bad result as what you imagine in your mind. It doesn't even come close. So I'll take myself, for example, my business partner at that time is like, hey, let's go make some videos on YouTube. We can do this together. And I was telling myself this story. The story I told myself is, A, do I want to be telling the world all my secrets? I mean, do I even have secrets? Two, if I say something and it's bombastic and it's polarizing, will I drive 
actual real paying clients away. And that was me probably being in a very fragile ego state to think that even clients have the time to watch a stupid YouTube channel with me on it, you know, all 400 views. And I had made up this big story in my mind about why I shouldn't do this. But luckily for me, he didn't take no for an answer. He was insistent. He's like, let's just do this. You don't have to say anything. Just sit there, smile. I'll do most of the talking. And that's literally what I did at the beginning. I said very little until I started to feel comfortable. And then this, is ha this happens to everybody. The more you expose yourself to something, the less you fear. The more that you'll try something. So the more you try something, the more you'll be exposed to something, the less you have to fear. And it just keeps going on and on and on. So just try it. Put yourself out there. Give it a go. And give yourself a lot of room to fail. So the mindset going in shouldn't be, this is the best thing I'm going to make, the best thing the world's ever seen. You should just say, this is going to suck. This is terrible. This is the first time I'm doing something. I have so much to learn. Don't puff it up to be this big old thing that you can fall down from. Build yourself up from the ground up. And that's usually how these things are done. Love it. Uh, is the future Christo on TikTok? <laughs> We do have a TikTok channel and there is some content with my face on it, but Mark Contreras is running that. I have too many platforms to work on. And to your question earlier, Ben, I can't do them all well and I cannot. So right now, TikTok is the domain of other people working on it until we figure it out, until they figure it out. When you're on, I invite you to do a virtual collaboration with me. All right. Um, all right. As someone who has been in the marketing space for a few years, what type of long form content would others find valuable? Uh, YouTube videos or instructional videos? I think if you put the time and energy into making a really well-crafted instructional video and you inject some personality, some flair, and you deliver it with some panache, that's the formula. And if you had to err between informing people and making it entertaining, sadly, based on what we found out, if you're more entertaining, people will watch. Because sometimes people are not ready to learn the way you, we think they're ready to learn. Uh, again, conversation earlier today with James Victory, he said, you know, I would sit down with my students. I tell them, here's how you make a million dollars. By the time you're my age, you're gonna have a million dollars in the bank if you do these 12 steps. And he says, the problem is none of you guys will do it. Mm -hmm. So even if it's in their own self-interest to do the work, to make money, People just don't take action. So keep that in mind that the person that's watching a video on YouTube on average spends about four minutes, four and a half minutes watching a video before they change their mind and do something else. So if you can design your lesson to be consumed in four minutes, you're doing something good for yourself and for your audience. And maybe they'll, they'll lean into it and actually watch a longer video from yours. Okay, this one's from Fen. If we are building out our web presence into all social channels to expand our footprint as an SME in the field, what channel should we focus on first? Hey, Fen, what's up? I think I know Fen. Um, what channel should you focus first to extend your web presence? Is that the gist of the question? Yeah, well, exactly. Yeah. That would largely depend on your audience. So one thing that you need to do is to realize um, Moses can go to the mountain or the mountain can go to Moses. And I would think it's a lot easier for Moses, you, to go to the mountain, your client. So think about where the watering hole is for your clients. Like, where do they congregate? Where do they hang out? If you don't have a really good answer on this, it's a sign that you're poorly positioned and that you're reaching too broad of a market. Because when you narrow it down to one person, if you ask yourself, where does Jimmy or Jane hang out? You'll know exactly. But if you start to say like, where do the Janes hang out? And then where do people hang out? It becomes a lot harder to answer. So narrow your focus, your target market, figure out who they are and the patterns of behavior because you can, you can figure it out. Figure out where they get their news and information on, from. And it may not be where you think. It could be that they spend most of their time and energy on say LinkedIn versus Twitter. I don't know. Okay, uh, Ben Weiss. What would your advice be for someone looking to create their very first paid digital course? Okay. I'm going to share a story with you. And I think in the story, you're going to understand the answer. A while ago, I wanted to create a course on typography. I wanted to teach type. It's something that I knew. I knew well. I've taught it before. And I was thinking, this is great. I'm going to launch this class and see how many people buy it. 
And so sure enough, I put out the feelers. I said, hey, I'm gonna launch a type class. It's gonna cost this amount of money. Who'd be willing to take it? And there was an actual legitimate signup page where people could give me money. And only a handful of people signed up. And I was kind of disappointed, not quite depressed, but I was like, gosh, I, I, I thought more people would wanna take this from me. And I tell my wife and she's like, honey, here's the thing. We, meaning your classmates and I, know that you're good at type. And for some of the clients who've worked with us, they also know you're good with type. But the world doesn't know that. And to assume that they know that is crazy. What you need to do is to start to make content to show people that you're actually good with design and topography. So I put the plans on hold to launch the type class. I started to create content where I critiqued posters and I would give design advice. And then slowly but surely, people started to know me for this thing. So when we went to launch the topography course and we did a pre-sale before the course was even written or recorded, we got a bunch of interest, a lot of people signed up, and to date, it's one of our best-selling courses. Now, when we initially sold it, it was $69. Today, it's $299 for a slightly more polished, upgraded version of it. We've sold over $400,000 worth of courses from this one type course. So that would be my advice to you. Before you make the course, start to develop some expertise and authority by sharing content with the world. They'll show up if you do. Love it. All right, we got a lot of good questions. So we'll, <laughs> let's say hey, we're knocking them out. All right. Um, many of my clients put my services on pause and others cannot pay me until the situation passes. I found myself in the need to lower the salaries of my employees. How have you handled it with your team? This is from Alejandro. It's kind of a very tricky proposition that you're in, Alejandro. You're, you're doing work and you're becoming the financier without any uh, collateral from your client. That's what it sounds like. And so if you're the bank to this and you're the manager and, and one of your, your team said, hey, boss, we're going to loan people with no, no collateral, no equity, no, no, no way to guarantee that we'll get paid and we're not going to take any money, but we're going to spend all the money, you would probably get fired that day. So I would try to run your business a little differently. If clients are having a hard time paying you, you, you gotta get more creative with this. Do not keep taking on more work where you're paying your employees, but not bringing in any work because it's the fastest way I know how to go out of business because you cannot predict what happens. So somebody, one of your clients, well-intentioned says, we can't pay you right now, but we'll pay you in the future. They get laid off, that division gets shut down, that company goes under. How are you gonna collect? It's impossible to collect. This is where I think it's, it, you may want to, uh, to kind of hedge your bets here a little bit, that there's a number of clients that you love that have been very loyal to you. And when I say loyal to you, they paid you on time for numerous projects, maybe for a couple of years before you extend this super great credit to. I would probably limit the kinds of clients that you do this for to like maybe under 20%, 25% of your business overall, because it's dangerous to to leverage your entire company trying to help people on, on speculation that you're going to get paid. It just doesn't make sense. It reminds me of the cartoon Popeye where Wimpy is like, you know, can I eat the hamburger? I'll pay you, gladly pay you on Wednesday. It's like, we, we don't, don't do that. So to, to add to that, Chris, a lot of companies are choosing to do the 10 or 20% salary reductions over just yes. going into sort of deep layoffs. I, my preference is it's a bandaid. If you have to make cuts, you make cuts. Got to do it. What are your thoughts? Yeah, so uh, David Baker and Blair Enns talks about this in their, their podcast, The Two Bobs, and I heard them say this, that a lot of business owners, we hate laying off people. We hate feeling that we're responsible for this person's future. So we delay it. We lay off one person, we lay off two people, and we just do it slowly. It's like a slow bleed. But what happens is it sends signals to the rest of the team. Yep. It's just a matter of time before we lose our job. So instead of the team doing what they need to do to keep you afloat and to get you business, they start preparing their resumes. The fear kind of occupies their mind like we're next. Their advice is if you've got to let people go, let whatever you need to let go all at once. Don't do it over time. That way you have the runway that you need and you're sending a clear signal. We had to let these 10 people go, these four people go. The rest of you guys I can keep for the foreseeable future. Let's get back to work. Let's, let's rebuild this company so that we can bring our friends and our family, our work family back into the company because I hate to see them go. The other thing he said is, if you think about it like this, the day that you are contemplating letting somebody go, uh, think of that as the number of days that you can pay them for severance. 
So for example, if I'm thinking about letting somebody go and four weeks later, I let them go and I have no more money, their severance package would be zero. But if I act quickly, I can say to Mary and to Bob and to Kenny, look, I got to let you go. Here's four weeks severance. Hopefully this gets you through a rough patch and I wish the best for you. And I hope to have you back when we are in stronger financial health. Think about it like that. So if you let people go, let them go all at once, let them go early and use that money as severance versus just slowly like waiting it out. And it, it, it doesn't make sense. All right. This is Brandon. Uh, do you feel when this pandemic subsides that consumers and businesses are going to embrace the human interaction that's been missing? Or do you think people are going to correct efficiencies that were once overlooked and continue to grow the virtual workspace? Yes, there's my hope and there's reality. And I, I don't know what it's going to play out. My hope is this, is that the world changes all the time. We're very slow to react to it. I see memes go up on the internet about you know, the earth is sending us a signal, man. Get your act together because I'm going to bust another one of these things, these COVID-19s on you to correct the problem. In the short amount of time that we've been sheltering in place, the, the amount of uh, damage that humans have taken on the world is, it's kind of interesting. I see pictures of these turtles invading beaches and monkeys going wild in Thailand because people aren't around anymore. It's kind of interesting how the world and nature can correct itself without human intervention or, or uh, invasion. This is really important. So life after COVID-19 should be different because we're holding on to a past. It should be different. It should be more efficient. I, I imagine companies offering more work from home programs and getting uh, teleconferencing packages set up for their, their, their remote workers. Uh, we're, we're learning how to work more efficiently apart. We're learning how to survive without meetings. My God, if we could just abolish the meetings already, that would be a big improvement. If we can find ways of doing less wear and tear on the planet, that would be fantastic. Because think about what's happening right now or what's not happening is the burning of fossil fuels, people on the road, congesting things. There's some good that's coming out of this. There's yeah. a lot of bad, but it would be great if we can learn from that, implement more of the good and reduce the bad. Okay. This next one is Marcelo from Argentina. How you doing, Marcelo? I, uh, I think... I, I, I think, I don't, can't understand the question. I think believe in yourself got super real these days. Do you both mm -hmm. agree? Um, super real, is that good or is that bad? I don't know. <laughs> it sounds like it's good. If we assume that it's good, oh. we'll believe in yourself got super real. Like, well, I would agree. You got, it starts with yourself. A uh, person who doesn't love themselves, who doesn't believe in themselves, is hard to love, is hard to believe in. And it's an important time to trust your your basic logic and, and also common sense. This is a very difficult time when there's information that's totally inconsistent from the social distancing guidelines to um, the amount of deaths we have. Yes. Very confusing media sources. So basic common sense, I think is, can prevail here. Yeah. I was reading, I finished reading Brian Tracy's book, uh, The Power of Self-Confidence in that he talks about uh, Aristotle said that wisdom, this is Aristotle's definition, Wisdom is equal parts experience plus reflection. Mm -hmm. So if we want to be wise, we have to look at what's happened and not to ignore it. We have to reflect on the decisions we made that got us here and what's getting us through it so that when we come out of this, we can apply that moving forward. And to also written in the book about common sense, it's like being able to learn from the past so that you grow. So this is why I think, should life be the same after this? I don't think it should be the same at all. Businesses need to correct themselves. We need to kind of reevaluate how we work, how we spend time together as a family, how we entertain one another, what is necessary, what's unnecessary, and what's overindulgent, and, and to be able to make those changes. Sadly, like I said, there's my hope, and then there's reality. I'll, I'll try to remain optimistic, but I'm also a realist at the same time. All right. Uh, this is Jared. Have you used paid campaigns on Instagram to gain followers? Me, personally, I have not. Uh, I've not paid for a single follower. I've never boosted anything on Instagram. And I'll tell you, it's not even pride or anything. It's just, I don't know how to do anything on Instagram. Uh, I was uh, posting uh, on my stories earlier that I'm going to be on live with you today, Ben. And I remembered there was a young man who worked for me for a period of time. Our office manager, his name is John. I had asked John, like, how do I post something on stories? I don't, I don't understand this interface at all. 
And so he has to teach an old guy like me. And I was just remembering that as I was posting that today. So I don't know how to do all the fancy stuff. All I know how to do is make good content. And what's interesting is I develop um, internet friends who reach out and say, Chris, uh, you should use hashtags and let me help you. Or Chris, you need to post on IGTV. Let me help you. And so that's the, the, the goodwill that we were talking about before that people will reciprocate if you give them value because they see the value that you've given them. And we like to even the score. Nobody likes to take a whole bunch of things and never give back. It's selfish. So if you do good in the world, people will give back. They give you, they give back in terms of giving you an opportunity like a job. They literally just give you money. Like my friend Fen, who was on earlier, they will do that to support you because they feel the impact of what you do. Okay. If I want to start giving Zoom workshops to designers and creatives, do I charge for them or should I give away a paid first and then start charging? I feel like we kind of answered this one already, but if you want to, I mean, give value away and build your audience and then charge. Now's not the time. Yeah, I think so. Try to give value first. The money will figure itself out. So this one's Courtney Long. Um, Chris, I admire your grind and have bought a lot of your products. What do you suggest for those of us that don't have a significant following on social media? How can we grow that audience? Okay, first of all, Courtney, thank you very much for supporting us. It's exactly like people like you who make this possible. You have to realize something that we all start with zero followers. We really do, if you think about this. And to say that I see where somebody's at at the middle or the end of their game and compare yourself at the beginning of your game, that's a tough spot to be in. It's not one I would do. When we first created content, I had no idea about like other YouTubers and what they were doing. I was mostly focused on myself. What can I do? How can I improve? So here's what I would like for you to do, Courtney. Put out a piece of content. Now you can inform yourself. You can learn about best practices and all that kind of stuff. So you don't have to do it willy nilly and be ignorant about it. You can put something out. Every time you put something out, look at the measurement that matters to you and ask yourself a couple of questions. Ask, what did I do well? What could I do better? Or what, or what would I do differently? And apply the lesson moving forward. You'll find that in short order, you'll make a lot of progress and you're going to figure this thing out and you're going to grow an audience. And if you give from a truly generous, selfless place, people can feel that, they can see that. And the last thing I would tell you is don't just repeat what everybody else is doing because there's already a lot of people doing that. Even if you take a message that inspires you and you want to put that out there, put your voice in it through your design, through your language, through your experiences and filter it. That's how you remix things. That's how you make things fresh. Awesome. This one's Cameo. How do you recommend building enough of a following on Twitter to use it as a testing platform for content? That's a great question. Uh, I, I got to tell you, I'm not very good on Twitter. I, I'm barely scratching 40,000 followers, I think. And it takes so much work to get those 40,000. Whereas on TikTok, I hear that you can get 100,000 followers in two days. So, so the kids tell me. And I, I don't know. Uh, find whatever platform you're strongest at right now that requires the least amount of work and use that. It could be LinkedIn. It could be Instagram. I don't know. Uh, for, for you, is YouTube as top of the funnel and that sort of sprayed down the other platforms, right? Well, I, I start actually, yes. Our biggest following right now is on YouTube. And I bet if I worked on Instagram a little bit more than I do, Instagram could overtake YouTube as my largest audience. But I like YouTube because it's evergreen content. People can find it. It's easily indexed and searchable. It can live for many, many years, long after you've created it. But for me, I, I play in Twitter. Uh, ben, what, what do you use to play? So for validation, for growth hack stuff, I use LinkedIn. Perfect. Um, that's where I, I started the short form. They called it broetry. You know, I was one of the guys who <laughs> I like that name. popularized it. I didn't come up with it. I would never have called it that, but that's what they were calling it. Yeah. And through that, I, you know, about 40,000, no, yeah, I think 40,000 followers on, on LinkedIn. Yes. And then, um, now I'm actually experimenting with TikTok quite a bit for ideas for YouTube. Great. Um, TikTok is super fast, right? TikTok is very fast. And yeah. I sort of broke through a lot of the, the myths that there are only little kids and young people on there. Uh, I actually found... I'm not dancing, I promise. Sorry to disappoint anyone in advance. It's mostly finance and marketing and econ content, but I have found there are older audiences and then how do I convert them to other platforms? So yeah. 
I guess the short answer is lead with your strongest platform. Right. And if you like talking, if you have a really good voice or you know how to compose music and songs, you might consider podcasting. Uh, although you don't get great conversation uh, in terms of a bi-directional conversation, but just use whatever it is that is most natural to you, the one that you're most comfortable with and the lowest barrier to entry. This is really critical. You got to just make something, okay? And then you can try it out. And if you feel, if you feel like it, Courtney, reach out to me on Twitter, show me what you got, and then I'll, I'll try and give you some feedback. That's an offer just to Courtney. Everybody else don't send me anything. I won't respond to you. I promise. Mm -hmm. Um, Chris, what inspired you to start educating? Why 1 billion? Mm, okay. My passion in education has actually started many, many years ago. It actually started when I was in school. Uh, I've always admired my teachers and I had a connection with them because for the first time in college, I felt like I was going somewhere with my life versus just memorizing whatever the mouths were telling me to memorize. I felt alive. I found myself. So I saw myself in my teachers and that one day I was thinking, Maybe I can also share this gift that you have so graciously given to me. Five years after I graduated, this is in 2000 here, I started teaching and I taught for 15 years. So this took me all the way to 2015 since when I first started teaching. The, the mission of teaching a billion people is just an extension of those early days teaching a handful of students in a private art school. And the experiences that I had were so wonderful that I was thinking, how do I share this with somebody who isn't able to live in Los Angeles because it's expensive to live here, who can't afford this tuition, who maybe just for a number of different reasons because of a socioeconomic or even political point of view, just can't do this. So that began this quest, this search for a different way of teaching. And it's been a learning curve for me for sure. Uh, you don't get to interact with people, like I said before. I have to talk to them through venues and platforms like this. Yeah. It's been the most rewarding experience of my life. I got to tell you, I'm in the third part of a three act career and this is what I'm going to be doing until I'm dead. So the 1 billion is a giant ambitious number. It's my BHAG, my big hairy audacious goal. Mm -hmm. And that's going to drive me to the, to the day I'm dead. Love it. It's awesome. Uh, all right. So last question, everyone, because we, you've got a lot of great ones and I'm seeing a lot of, uh, people who want to ask a lot more. So if you do have multiple questions, which some of you do, uh, feel free to send it to me and it, you know, we'll, we'll do our best to get Chris to answer them later, but I just want to try to get through everybody and this will be posted on YouTube so everyone can watch later. So let's jump into Chris's question, which is my agency works with a pretty big brand on their social platforms here in the UK. Their internal team is dead set on a pushy sales approach. Even at this time, we keep trying to move them away from this, but with little success so far, do you have any advice on how to encourage them to move in a different direction? Yeah. So here's the thing. It's very tricky because you want to gamble with somebody else's brand and their money. And I get it. They should be able to control that. So what I would ask, if you have the relationship, if you have the trust of the people who have hired you, say, can we run an ABE experiment? Say like, okay, what's our highest, most best performing, highest performing post that we've ever done? And we sold, right? We were like salesy on these things. Uh, allow me to try it maybe in three posts. And I'll even volunteer to do some of this at cost if you're willing to try. And if these outperform the originals, can we agree that this is the path moving forward? And then you pay me back for the amount of money that I've spent. So I'll do it at cost. And if it works out, you then owe me money. But moving forward, you pay me money and we do it the right way. And I wouldn't say the right way. We do it the new way. Is that okay? And just have, have open dialogue. I think a lot of times what happens with creatives is we'll get a lot of passive aggressive energy rather than say what we think because we don't have the courage to say it because we're afraid of hearing no or being yelled at or whatever it is. We don't say anything. And then we can become really bitter people, bitter creatives, bitter designers. Then we take it out on design Twitter. That's really what happens, right? You take all that negative stuff, the, the, the crushed soul and the spirit, and you jam it out on Twitter. Have the courage to say what you think to ask them, is this okay? And be a reasonable, empathetic human being when you say this versus being an arrogant, pretentious, self-centered person and, and say it and see what they'll say. Now, if I were a business owner and this creative firm that I love and trust and give money to had said this, I, I have to step back. Even if it's something I'm not comfortable with, I would stop to say, well, you really care about this much. You're willing to do that cost. I hear you, Mary. 
Let's just do this. You, no need to do this work at cost. Do the full price. Bill me extra this month. Let's run an A-B test. I'm also curious if this is the way to go. And see what happens. Awesome. Chris, thank you for coming on today, brother. Uh, we pleasure, went man. a little extra, so I'm, I'm very grateful for, for this time. Keep doing this amazing work. Um, it's, it's inspired me for years from the days when I saw you, the core and the stuff with Jose. Oh, oh wow. I mean, of all the guys out there, your content, I, I think everyone in this group agrees that it's just, it's the hottest. So keep, keep doing, keep doing what you're doing. And yeah, we, I think we'd love to see more of, you know, survival stuff yes. and what we can do. And for everyone out there, uh, feel free to send over, you know, other questions. We'll do our best, no promises, but we'll try. <laughs> And this video will be uh, sent out to everyone who registered for Zoom. Fantastic. Ben, thanks for having me. It was my pleasure.